Hi, Chris. Thank you for joining me on the podcast. It's great to speak to you. How are you doing? Sounds. I love. Nice to meet you, Ethan. Nice one. Sound. Yeah, man. So you banned the real people. We'll get on to how it all started and that soon. But you've just announced a tour starting in September. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, we um we went out last year. We hadn't been out for a good few years. Like um a guy called oh what's his fucking name. A guy called Sean Morgan was put on the radio. She called a scene on Liverpool and for all. And um, it turns out he used to be our manager when we was on our very first cassette, uh, 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 very first release, an EP, a little cassette uh, in 1988. Fucking get on that. <laughs> uh, he was the promoter to the gig. I hadn't seen him for a while. And uh, we got up with Oxy Colour as we usually do when we see the lads. They ask us to get up and do Day Tripper. Uh, we got up and smashed it on Day Tripper. And the place just went off electric. And he comes off and he goes, what are you doing? Have you got anything new to pour out or anything? And then he, we, we got talking. I said, look, it's 35 years since we've done that. Um, we've done that cassette tape with you, our first release. He said, well, should, should we call it 35 years, the real people? Because that was your first thing out. So he put, he, he's a promoter for the O2 and stuff like that. So he more or less uh, bought the tour off us, gave us a little bit of funding to go out and do it. So we never had done money off it, but it paid for itself. And as you know now, fucking... You're earning a little bit more on the merch now, so that sort of pay for the hotels and stuff. But it was just great to get back out, you know what I mean? So I think that one, the last tour was only about eight, eight or nine gigs or something. This has gone up again, so there's, it's it's growing, growing. Like, so, yeah, it makes up. Are you looking forward to Yeah, I'm in the studio now trying to get some... I'm going to try and get something, release something new material. So I've been recording for ages, but we had a big revamp in the studio. The lad that you've seen there before setting the thing off for me, Pat, he's um he's our studio engineer. So we've been there. We've, he's had a major operation on his back. So while he was having that major operation on his back, we've done a revamp in the studio. So we're just getting back in now, trying to get the old files transferred from old computers to new computers and start working again. So when did you first take an uh, interest in music then, going all the way back? Um, well, me, me dad's a musician. My dad's been in cabaret bands since I was, since I can remember, since I was a kid. And my brother, and I've got a cousin called Diggsy. I don't know whether you know Diggsy's Dinner. Yeah, but, yeah. But he's my cousin. My dad was, uh, when my brother and our Diggsy were young, they they joined like a, um, a little kid's group. And they were always out gigging and stuff like that. Um. Yeah, just being music in the family, like a lot of my cousins and a lot of stuff like that, all, all play. When we have family parties, it's time to grab the guitar of people, do you know what I mean? Let me have a go, do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, so just always been doing that. Um, left school early, um, got in a band with our kid, um, and about 15, and we had our first record there by the time we were 17, I was 17. And then, then we started the real people properly, like, you mentioned your brother there, Tony. What's the age gap between you two? Four years. Did you grow up listening to the same music then? Yeah, yeah. We shared the bedrooms, so we stayed listening to the same sort of things all the time, yeah. Yeah, we, we're still the same. We still hang around with each other more or less every day. And uh, we still fight like cat and dog. That's why he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> Something I wanted to ask was, there's a lot of great music and bands that come out of Liverpool. Why do you think that is? Well, obviously for the Beatles, thing, you know what I mean, and the, the Mercy B thing for for years ago, it's just it's just a great generation. I am with to tell you what the truth nowadays, mate. We've got all we've got Lipper that's here, which has got like students from all over the world that come, um, and it's just what what I find is um, a lot of the students that come to Lipper and they do the, the graduation and stuff like that, they end up staying in Liverpool. So there is a big, vibrant music scene, but some some of them are fucking scousers, you know what I mean? Yeah. They're all lipper students and stuff like that, but they're, they're what well, scousers like they'll, they'll welcome anyone. So it's like you can get it, you can get a, a scouts band now with a Norwegian in it, and like someone well, like we we've got a um, uh, we had a keyboard player from South Korea, uh, a fellow called uh, Miru. He was playing with us for a while. He was from um, he was from Lipper, and now we've got a guitarist who steps in with us. I don't even know where he's from. <laughs> you know what I mean, I think he, I, I don't know, but he's uh, he's not from Bootle anyway. <laughs> what, was, <laughs> what was the Liverpool uh, music scene like in the late eighties and nineties? Obviously, with you and the Lars and bands like that. Mate, it was fucking mad. It was great. Yeah, we had we had such a laugh. We used to go to this club called. All the bands used to hang around together, 
And if you ever got sacked from a band or wearing a band, you go and join one of your other mates' bands because you're all mates, you know what I mean? Uh, we all go to the same clubs together. It all turns out that when the record companies it's on Liverpool and the Lars went off and stuff like that, um, and everyone was getting signed, we were all getting signed. You know what I mean? It was like every band had the record deal at the time. We all used to go and drink in the same clubs, then we'd all go back to the same parties. And yeah, it was great. It sounds. Do you feel like you and the Lars came along too early in a way, just before Britpop? The Lars will always be the Lars, because you know what I mean? They, are, they would have dis di um, distanced themselves from Britpop anyway, because Lee was always wanting to try and get this little garage sort of band sound that he's had, and this thing that was in his head, that he's he's, ne he's never as commercially, he's never actually released. He might He's still recording them songs, I, I believe. He's still recording some new songs. Um, you just, I don't really know. I don't know whether you were too early or, or what, but the last were brilliant. I, I had a good listen to them again the other week. I just like, I have like little um, little evenings where I'll just listen to the same band all night or even sometimes just the same album. I'll listen to it like 14 times or something. <laughs> I'll, I'll listen to like the bass lines and I'll listen to all different things on it. And um, yeah, I had a large night the other night. I was just like some of the demos and stuff. I've actually got um, the very first demo that they recorded. Yeah, um, Patty, we just seen there. He worked on uh, the picket sessions when he was only about 15. He was the engineer on the picket sessions. If you'd ever see any of that, Jeez, yeah. Did you like the album then? Because obviously, he doesn't like it, does he? Lee, but yeah, I, think I, it's a great album, I but loved it. it when you when you real, when you realize what's actually happened with it that um, they have taken take different takes from different sessions and maybe make them together. Do you know what I mean? The pop probably put BVs on or guitars that weren't actually there, that, which he hates. But it got that down, that that long down the line that they needed to get something out because they recorded with like several different producers. And uh, I think Gotis was just like, that was spending too much money. We need to get something out. And uh, yeah, I think it stands the test of time. I think it sounds great. Back to the real people. You started off playing clubs uh, when you first started. How do you look back on those days? Yeah, as I say, they were, um, we were... We were just playing anywhere we could. At one stage, we had a um, we'd lost one of the pracky rooms that we had because we paid the rent, so we got a um, we got a room in the local community centre, and um, to pay our our sort of rent on the room, we used to do a um, we used to do a gig every Tuesday afternoon for the dockers because all the dockers used to go is that at the at, in Bootle at the bottom of the dock rows, all the dockers used to go in there for the, a, a pint in the afternoon. We used to do a gig on a Tuesday afternoon. Then we um. We got our own um, residency there. I think it was like a Thursday or something like that. And in a few pubs around Bootle, we used to get out like a name. But them days, it was different, you know what I mean? You go to a pub and everyone was skidding up and stuff like that, you know what I mean? It was it was a bit crazy, like. And um, yeah, yeah, great. Fantastic. Good times. <laughs> um, <laughs> you had a song called One By One that your brother wrote that uh, yes. Cher covered. Can you remember hearing about her covering it? Yeah, um, he, we actually he actually wrote that in, in our bedroom just on this little reel to reel um eight track that we had. Um a guy from Polydor, a fellow called Lucien Grange, uh, signed us on that one song. There's a few other little songs that got recorded about five times, different producers. Um and it never actually got released properly. Um we, uh, it was there was a little deal going around with Polydor records, but it never actually got released. Uh, years later, um, this Lucian Grange was um, head of A&R for Cher, I think it was Warner's, something like that. And uh, Cher was looking for a song, and he always loved this song, and he just he got us to cover it. But at that time, we were doing the Oasis demos, we were doing the live demonstration tape, and we got a phone call, oh, Cher's recorded one of your songs, and we were like, oh, fucking hell, Cher. <laughs> we, were like, we didn't realise how... how National, nationally, she big, big she was, not nationally, worldwide, like massive she was. You know what I mean? He was always new to the name. And then it was only until we got started getting the royalties in at one stage. You said, oh, she's all right, our auntie. You know what I mean? <laughs> not anymore. We've got loads of songs. <laughs> <laughs> you did write for some other uh, bands and artists. Do you take the same approach when you write songs for yourselves and other people? Well, I. At one stage we did because we we have signed a few good few publishing deals over the years and stuff like that. 
writing's a gift. It doesn't matter who you're writing with. And some mates I've wrote with rappers and all sorts of things. You, you just wouldn't think it, you know what I mean? I've been to Nashville, wrote with like country artists. Um, it's it's just, you can't be a snob about music. Like the only things I don't, I don't really like is like heavy, like metal. Yeah, like, I don't like that. Stuff nah. like that. Yeah. But anything else, I'll try and turn my hands to, you know what I mean? I think I'd look a soft cunt fucking rock side to rap like. But I would, I, sometimes I'll, I'll get stuck into the lyrics with them or something, you know what I mean? Or anything. Um. Yeah, no, it's just like wearing a different hat. Do you know what I mean? You go in and go, okay, let's. What sort of genre are we going for? Well, you're usually usually writing for that artist. So do you know what I mean. You've usually listened to them before, or or if it's just a case of you jamming or writing with other people, which which we do as well. You know what I mean? We have people in the studio who come, and um, you might have a few songs for an album, or you might have a few pingos, and you might need something else. So we'll go. I'll go, go and listen to you. There's something a bit more up here. So we have a little jam and see what we can come up with. That's what we do. You mentioned the LP that you released in 88. How did that come about? Well, um, I think at that time we had our little um our little studio in the um, in the community centre. And as I said before, regarding that Sean Morgan, who got us got us on this tour again, so 35 years later, he was um the I don't know, he used to book all the bands for the Liverpool Poly. Um, he got us gigs with it, so he liked he liked to come to be to see us somewhere. Might have been playing with the Lars. We support the Lars a lot. Uh, he been to see us, liked us, uh, and wanted to help us out. It wasn't really a management thing. We didn't sign a management deal or anything like that. He was just a good guy. He was helping us out at the time, um, and he lent us the money. He lent some lent some of the money to go and record it in a cheap studio in Liverpool. And I think the deal was that. He was getting us support gigs, like and anyone who was on the poly, like Stone Roses, for his example. I think it was a good few that, that he got us, and maybe he took his money back from getting us the gigs or whatever. I'm not really sure whether we ever paid him back. You know what I mean? <laughs> but that was that was it. It was um, we had these. It was we were at the stage where the bands recorded. Lo- uh, we wrote loads of songs and we hadn't recorded them, so I think we just went in the studio for a week or a few days and threw them down. One of my favourite songs is on that LP, uh, Throw It Away. Yeah, yeah, it's a classic song that makes... It's an old, one of Noel Gallagher's favourite uh, Real People songs, that as well. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But in 91, you released your debut album, self-titled debut album. Yeah. Uh, what was it like getting an album out there? Oh, it was absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, um, yeah it was... Yeah, great. I was... I think I must have been 21 at the time. Um, yeah, we signed a massive record deal, massive publishing deal. We were uh, yeah, times were good then. Marshmallow Lane was supposed to be the follow up album from that album, yeah. but it didn't come out till 2012. How come? Well, it's supposed to come out in '92, so 2012. How, how many years is that? That's nearly 30 years. 20, isn't it? 20 years. Is it 20 years? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so 20 years later. Um, yeah, we've recorded that. We've. Um, we sort of with with they doing the first album, it was like there was a lot of like the Happy Monday stuff going around, and it was like at the end of the baggy area, do you know what I mean? Oh, but the baggy scene. So some of the songs had that sort of baggy beat and stuff like that, a little bit more dancey than we we usually were. Um, second album, we started going back to like we were quite psychedelic at that time, do you know what I mean? We were taking a lot of fucking trips and fucking stuff like that, and going. <laughs> raves and um listening to a lot of psychedelic music um so the second album was a bit more experimental really um in the end the record company what, what actually happened to us we we started recording the second album and more or less finished the second album we were recording one of some fantastic producers a fellow there fellow who produced the rolling stones jimmy miller he's done a lot of the stuff on it um but what happened was the, our first album was taken off in America as we just finished the second album, really. So we had to go step back and start touring the first album over in America. And then when we come back from America, um, all the people had changed in the rec- in the the, the um, record company. So a guy who signed us, um, Gail who signed us, called Diane Young. She left. Uh, the head of A and R was Muck Winwood, Steve Winwood's brother, used to be in the Spencer Davis band. He left. So everyone who signed us and sort of got us. I'd move jobs. So we were just like a, a, a statistics sort of thing, you know what I mean? 
So in the end, yeah, they let us go, and the album got shelved and never come out. And it was only till like tw- or after twenty years later that uh, we realised that the songs had reverted back to us, and we just put it out on our own little label. You don't realise that with fans, really, from a fan's perspective, that like f- little things in the background can change, and it can totally change a band's career or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it was mad. It was like we we we'd come home from from America, and our mum and dad had moved. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, oh, company, no one knew us. It was like like I don't know who are you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was a bit strange, and it was a bit like disheartening. But we just got to crack on. I think it's like widely public knowledge now, but a few years ago it wasn't that you and uh, Tony played a big part in the start of Oasis's career. Yeah, How yeah. Did you first meet the band. Well, you met Noel first, didn't you? I'm sure I had met Liam. I had met Liam because I'm sure I, I helped Liam through the, uh, the back door of one of our gigs years and years ago in uh, Northampton. Because is it? I'm sure it was him. Um, but yeah, no, it was the road to with the Inspiral Carpets. We were touring with the Inspirals. Um, and we just, me and Noel got on. We started hanging around together and stuff like that. And he just said, I'm in a, I'm in a band with my, uh, my brother as well. So um, he sent me a demo. And the demo wasn't all loud, I didn't think. Uh, went to see them in rehearsals and they were good, they were all right. Uh, so they come, I said, come down to our studio and he brought Mark Hoyle with him, who was uh, there. He was the Inspirers on stage sound man. Um, so he was, Mark was engineering and I was just trying to get the vibe, producing it a bit, saying maybe just do one chorus here instead of two choruses all the time. And just, uh, yes, yeah, so we produced the um, live demonstration um, tape. But in, all in all, I think we recorded about 12 songs. Maybe a bit more. What was on that first demo he sent you, like right at the start? Nothing. Was, yeah, I think it was must be the music or something like that. And it, it was a bit naive, like uh, not very good. Now. No, no, not very what, good. No. What uh, made you like take an interest in them? Was it seeing them live? Like what attracted you to him? Oh, no, it was just. Do you know what it's like? Makes people have got personalities. Like um, no one has a. Well, that was a great personality, and you know, we we'd phone up, he'd phone me up, and we talk for hours on the phone. Do you know what I mean? Um, and then when he did come down, for me for, from when he comes down the first time, when we we we'd met, he'd met Liam again at the um, a few times through the um, the Inspirals tour, and me and our kid were like that. He's starting. We just got something about him. What you see is what you get. Do you know what I mean? And then it was definitely like if he's involved and so and so, yeah, let's let's do it. And then he comes down. And we had they the got themselves tight and they could play. Um, at, at first, what were you more or less doing? We just set the room up live and we just recording it live. And then we maybe go just do a little bit of editing on it, or not even editing, just saying we can do that again, but to a different take, you know what I mean? You can see, <clears throat> sorry, you can see a difference between the early demos before they met you and after. Yeah. You had a big influence on the songwriting, like you've mentioned. Um but you also had an influence on Liam singing. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, it's 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 well known that um, Liam hadn't really sang in the studio. I think he'd been in the studio once before for us to hear this demo. Um, but when we were recording, um, he hadn't really um, he wasn't really used to the headphones, and he was like, "Oh, can't fucking do it, man." So um, I'd say, "Well, listen, let me let me put the vocal down, especially on Columbia." So let me put the vocal down and then you sing over me, then we'll take me out. And then obviously when you do do that, you get like other people's phrasings and stuff like that. I wouldn't say that he, I, I told him to sing like this or to sing like that. It was just that he was we were, he was phrasing over my phrasing. And I think because he was into the real people, it's like I'm into the Beatles and people would say that I, I sound a bit like John Lennon sometimes or, you, you know what I mean? You're not, you're, you sound like your influences sometimes, you know what I mean? So I think that was it really. Yeah, whatever you're listening to, you're gonna like unconsciously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Noel always says he wrote he had the songs wrote for definitely maybe a morning glory when he was still working. Is oh, that hello, bollocks? <laughs> um, I'm say, uh... No, he was he had he had them songs that we were recording on. Maybe he might have had a few ideas and I think in, in the back of his head or something, but I remember him writing Dixie's dinner when he was in our studio. Cause it's a bad rip-off of a um, a play song on um Modern life is rubbish, I think. Sandy, Sandy, here again, the dead. It's something like that, I can't remember. But um, yeah, he was. It's made, what happens when, like, you've got things to do? Sometimes the songs just come, do you know what I mean? It's like you're like, oh, we've got to finish this album next month. You're writing three songs a day. 
it's it's just the actual the, the actual gifts from God, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You mentioned there he ripped Blur off. Uh, he's yeah. pretty well known for ripping bands off and <laughs> yes. Uh, he ripped one of your songs, Feel the Pain off. Don't yeah, not just that one, mate. There's a good few. And there's a good few like little melodies and stuff like that here and there. But shit happens. What can you do? You know what I mean? Oh, it, yeah. I mean, it breaks your heart sometimes. And especially on that song, because it was at um we ended up taking like a, a very small out called settlement, really considering what the I got my name on Rock and Share, which was Rock and Share was just the song of mine called Growing Old. Wasn't exactly the same song, but it had like the same some same lyrics in and stuff like that. And um, he just took that song and um, took it in the studio and wrote his own little thing you know, over it, but over over my over my original song really. Uh, there is quite a few like, yeah, but it was heartbreaking the first when I heard that one. Uh, the well, the rocking but, chair one, or the don't go away. Oh, no, don't go away one. Do you know what I mean? Really, but, I mean, yeah. he's not even tried to hide it, has he? He's just fully took oh, it. No, it's just fucking fully taken off. You know what I mean? You might as well just covered the song. Hello. <laughs> But um, yeah, that was we were we got badly advised by our solicitor at the time because I think um we couldn't get no legal aid because we broke that share song and we were like we weren't on the dole or not like that. Do you know what I mean? So all us all us they had to do was just keep, they just kept sending us like solicitors letters and this that and the other denying things and we had to go to musicologists and this that the other which is completely you don't need a musicologist to say that that's fucking ripped off from that song you know what I mean <laughs> but you've got to have the musicologist report and stuff and next minute the bills were just getting atrocious so we ended up just settling on one of the first offers just thinking we 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 have never ever wanted to be the band who go around saying Oasis ripped us off we were only there to help them out do you know what I mean we were never there there for all, all like a, you know, the worst one is oh, oh is that the real people crying about fucking about Oasis again I've never done that do you know what I mean I've never really done that but some people, some people think you are because that's the story that people can get get some press out of. You know what I mean? The thing but, is, that I think you deserve the recognition for starting them out. Do you know what I mean? You gave them that chance, really. Well, that's that's why we were like, "What's he doing this for?" Do you know what I mean? We helped them out. Do you know what I mean? When they had fuck all, now we got fuck all. You know what I mean? We've lost our deal. They are absolutely. Fucking the biggest band of, of the 90s, well, biggest band of a good few generations, you know what I mean? And they're not giving it back, they're not helping us back at all. They're, they're, they're going, No, you never done that, you never done that. And then uh, give us that boss pity or song, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of them, what can you say, man? Um, and obviously, I know you wouldn't be like bothered about the money side of things, but it's the thing of putting your name down to show like respect in it and obviously turn fans onto your music and stuff. Well, that was it. As as you know about that song, the uh, rock and share, I got a I got a percentage on. There was a, there was a few that were under under like um, litigation, really. Um, uh, oh, well, it's Columbia. I, I I wrote all of I I wrote all the verses in Columbia. I wrote the verse and the melody in for the first verse in Columbia. Um, Liam wrote the Liam wrote the chorus. Uh, I can't tell you. Lee, uh, Noel wrote a few words. The second verse, really. What I hear is not what I hear. I hate to see the sounds, sounds, but they're not very clear. That was it. Do you know what I mean? Um, so there was Don't Go Away and Columbia that uh, I never got anything for. They just they just give me a credit on, on Rock and Share, which was only a beast. Hold on a minute, lad. This will be my mum. No worries, no worries. Oh, it's all right. I'll tell you our kids. Buttons and <laughs> Yeah, so... Um, yeah, that was the worst question. I ended, I ended up just taking it. Um, I was called Settlements on that, which is fucking silly, really. And that we only took that first album because we were getting hassled by the by the um by the solicitors because they, they just thought we were two scholars who weren't going to pay them. Do you know he didn't even like you say they didn't even credit Liam with a songwriting thing on Columbia, so um, kind of yeah. shows. Well, yeah, that was the main thing. If they would just give us a, even the smallest the smallest of percentages. And just because that's all we wanted, really, for like say, like on the first album, on the first album, on uh, definitely maybe um, when it come out, because it was always promised that I'd get a credit for Columbia, with like a um, it's an agreement between me and No. Um, when it come out, he goes, "Oh, don't worry about it." He said it's only the first like fifty thousand or something that have been pressed, and he knew they were gonna, well, they're gonna have to do loads and loads of more repressions. I'll get your name on it. I'll get your name on it. 
So uh, well, all right, well, it'll, it'll come about, and then it just never. And then when he got fucking that big, he didn't want to backtrack there and say that he hadn't wrote it all himself. Do you know what I mean? So one of them, and then um, with with Columbia, I just, um, oh no, then then it was um, then it was don't go away. That was the big one. And that was that was the whole thing that made made me really go right. I'm not having this. I'm gonna take the this. That was on B and now on it, one of the biggest signed yeah. albums and stuff. So it would have helped you out, wouldn't it? Yeah, right, yeah. So I but and then these the, um Rock and Share has already been uh, the B side of Roll with it. So the first number one. Yeah. So there was some fucking money there to be made by <laughs> five days that I never ever got. Scandalous, really. Do you remember hearing him doing these versions of songs? And no, our kids was it uh, went down um when they were Recording once down in London and um, no plays him some B sides in the studio. I think Owen Morris was there or something like that. And um, he plays him rock and chair. I caught a kick. I was that's our kid's old demo. What's going on? He goes, Oh, I thought it did it somewhere before. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, uh, were you in the studio when they wrote Supersonic? Yeah, yeah, did, uh, did he write that himself or? Yeah, well, well, I don't know. You've heard the stories about it. They were there to do another song. Well, the, the, it was Columbia on it. They were meant to do. Uh, they were, it wasn't even. I think it was like the B side that, that was on the thing. I think it was that take me away. Also, the story goes that they were there to record Bring Her On Down, but we were all there, and it's only they ever they ever play Bring Her On Down there. Um, we taking them. This is the God's on the street space. We we taking them from doing the demos and that. Uh, and then he got signed, and then we were going to um where we'd been recording, where the real people had done all of our stuff was the Motor Museum. It's called the Pink Museum. It's called it's called the Motor Museum now. It's called the Pink then. Um, so we took him in the studio. We had our engineer Dave Scott. He was the real people's engineer and, and like co-producer. He was he was engineering it. Mark Coyle was engineering, like co-engineering it, and we were supposed to be producing it. Which was that was that was the, the thing we we done the early demos we so we took them to the first single really, and then it just went off and as as you can, you can see in one sort of way, they were getting that big. They didn't want to just like have um two lads from Liverpool produce an album that like we would never really produced big bands before. Do you know what I mean? So we could see how I was getting taken out of our hands, but then our kid got um. Because they were backing vocals on Supersonic, but we never got no uh, production engineering or anything like that credits. But we never really engineered it. We were, but we were there and creating the vibe. And sometimes that's what a producer does. Do you know what I mean? And it was our kids. Who had, if, if it wasn't for our kids, Columbia would never have got written. Wouldn't it have been, have been, been done? Because they were just they were just sound check and setting, we were setting mics up and doing this, that, and the other. And he was he just started having this little jam. And then uh, when it comes to like, okay, we're going to start recording, they started playing another tune. And I kid goes, what are you doing? He said, whatever you were playing there is fucking well better than what you're playing there now. So that's how it started. So we said, listen, why you got that fresh in your head? Let's just throw it down. So there's no lyrics for it or not. We said, just throw it down. It's a new idea. So they threw the new idea down live and then uh, no wrote the lyrics in about half an hour. It is sly when you wear it, like, how they treated you and stuff. I'm a big fan of Oasis, but you can't deny that, can you? Then? Oh yeah, I know. Mate, it's, it's the worst one was was like um, was your parents and your bed and stuff like that. You know what I mean? because they 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 knew that we were we were enjoying ourselves helping them out, but we were helping them out. You know what I mean? And yeah, then yeah. when when you hear the um the actual rip offs and stuff like that, and they're completely denying things and that. It's when you've got to pull up with your mark, going, I told you about them, Manx. <laughs> <laughs> when did it start getting sour then after you were to don't go away? Yeah, uh, we were we were in the uh, Motor Museum or the Pink Museum because our manager actually owned the studio at the time, a fellow called Hamby. And um, it, it was the day the, the uh, album got released, so I don't know whether it was like a thing, you know, um, a preview on Radio 1 or something. But we listened, to, uh, it was every track, or we, we had a promo of it. We listened, I was listening to every track to see if I could find any um, any little rip-offs, you know what I mean? And, he, and then I was listening, and then I just went, don't go away, say that you'll stay. I was like, ah! <laughs> punching, a, punching a hole in the, uh, in the ceiling, this uh, the manager's office. That's it must be horrible, that, hearing your song. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we we were thinking, oh, they've been that being that cheeky about stuff anyway and stuff like that. I wouldn't want it to be anything else on this. So we were just listening, and then when it, it come, well, it's a full full rip. We were like, that fucking hell. Did you ever get? You know, you brought a uh, marshmallow all in like two thousand and twelve. Did people ever say, yeah. "You know, that sounds like if you copied Duck Go Away." <laughs> <laughs> a, lot, a lot of people didn't realise that we recorded it 20 years before you know what I mean? <laughs> and there was people arguing going no Oasis 1 was out before that you know no we recorded it in 1990 yeah. <laughs> um, so you supported a lot of uh, big artists over the years as well actually uh, you supported David Bowie what was that like sounds yeah we met him and all that it was lovely yeah uh, we've done a few gigs with Bowie we played Manchester with him uh, Manchester Cricket Ground, but um, at that time we was um, we had a few agents. I think it was hit and run or something with the agents. Where we had a few agents who were like, getting us really good gigs because we we had we had this feeling that we was it was going to kick off again. So um, we were touring with all sorts. We done loads of tours with Simple Minds and stuff like that. And next week we just got a it was a bank called the um, the White Stripes. I think it was. They had to cancel, and uh, he was playing in Denmark. We just got a phone call. Do you want to go to Denmark and play with David Bowie? We've got like fuck leg at the airport. <laughs> What's yeah, it so... like supporting like somebody like that where the crowd's probably a bit different to your crowd? What what's we, it like? Yeah, we've always been a bit of a uh, an opener act, you know what I mean? And uh, you just you just a lot of the time the, the, the audience don't want you to be there, do you know what I mean? They're not really listening and stuff like that. So you you just just trying to do your best. Yeah, but the year it was great. But is there ever a, a music- I mean, meeting him was meeting him was great you know what I mean we were we were all standing outside like the, uh, the dressing room was not, and he comes over and he goes oh I can't even do a bowie impression yeah. <laughs> um, yeah but he comes over and introduced himself and all that you know what I mean and just yeah the sounds and he, he stood on the side of the stage and watched what's us so that was is, he, yeah. Yeah. is there yeah. obviously Bowie's a big big name is there a musician or celebrity you've ever met that made you starstruck like Bowie yeah, but uh, do you know what? It, it, it becomes tossed up with anyone, really. You know what I mean? But most of the time, I'm not really like that. I'm just like, oh, I like me. How's it going? You know what I mean? So, who's your favourite uh, actually supported then? Bowie, or is there another? I don't really know. Oh, well, obviously, Ocean Coliseum, mate, because we, we've done that many gigs with Ocean Coliseum and we have that much of a good crack with them and stuff like that. They're my favourite to support, like yeah. Uh, yeah, you good mates with Ocean Colour Scene, aren't you? Yeah, we have been we have been since um nineteen ninety. Uh when we f- very first got signed and um they just released their very first album, well before Mosley Shows and stuff like that. Um they they used to come to Liverpool and, and support us and we go to uh, Birmingham and support them. Yeah. We uh, made since since yeah. Sorry, just back to Oasis for a question I, I wanted to ask. Um, on the 10 year anniversary, definitely maybe you and Tony were in the um, in the documentary. How did that come about? And you not we still not speak? Were you not speak at this time? No, I think we still weren't speaking. We just got got asked to do it. Um, that's more that's more when I think she's pissed, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't even like this <laughs> <laughs> Um Yeah, for the what. We don't we don't mind talking about things, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um yeah, so we've done that one and then after that one, we never got asked to do any any more interviews regarding like the thing, especially anything that they'd funded or was coming out under yeah. at least we never got the chance to put our story across. Do you know what I mean? Did they cut bits out of that interview with you in that? You what that? Did they cut bits out of the interview you did for that? But yeah, yeah, probably because it only it all gets edited down, doesn't it? We even done something for I don't know whether it was the Super Sonic movie, but uh, some guy come round to the studio here and uh, it was all just recorded in audio. And um, I actually watched them went to see the went to see the movie, and I was like waiting for some some of our bits to come on and nothing. But honestly, God, the the stories that we told and stuff like that, there was some real real good stuff in there. Do you know what I mean? I was thought, like, oh, some of that's going to ever be on there because it was funny. You know what I mean? And nothing, not a sausage. It's like we've been written out of history, really, when it comes to anything. Yeah, that's of... what I was thinking of trying to, yeah, write yeah. you out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when it's coming to anything that Oasis, uh, under the Oasis banner, we're, we're just not, we haven't existed. Do you know what I mean? 
Oh, you mentioned yeah. Diggsy again there. Uh, he don't like that song, does he? Diggsy's dinner. Oh, no. Yeah, that's a this one. We were walking down the street in Liverpool, and some bus, he, he threw some busker fucking a quiz or something, and the busker started to play in Diggsy's dinner. <laughs> <laughs> he took his crib back. <laughs> 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 a fucking class, that of it. He's but he seems mental, but he's funny. Well, he's mental, yeah, yeah. We have some good laughs together. Who? Um, so we've been on about Oasis. Obviously, brothers in the band that don't get on now. Uh, yeah. So how how have you and Tony been in a band for so long, and still seem to get on all right? <laughs> we we, st- we still live round the corner from each each other. I'm talking like from two minutes walk. Uh, me mum and dad live around the corner. We still like we're still quite really close family. We fa- we have about four arguments a day. We're still exactly the same. Do you know what I mean? But we love each other with all our hearts. Do you know what I mean? But he'll say black, I'll say white, some of the folks will say white. Do you know what I mean? And um, yeah, we're st- still the same. Still fight like cat and dog. Still love, love each other. Well, good, good. 14 years after um, your second album came, uh, is it Think Positive? Think Positive, yeah, that was recorded. Two, oh, really? 2010, that one came out. Yeah. But um, obviously the music scene and music business had changed a lot between those years. Did well, you before know- that as well, there was, there was uh, What's on the Outside as well before that, wasn't there? What, yeah, well, that 96, though. It was 96, yeah. Yeah, so in between them two albums, it had changed a lot. Did you notice that? Well, our sounds and uh, the songwriting and stuff like that. No, just the uh, music business and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think that like all downloads have started and stuff like yeah. that. The industry's completely changed now, mate. I honestly, my my lad's seventeen now. He just joined his first band. He just started writing and stuff like that. And I'm like, I sound like I sound like my dad years ago. Well, you need to get yourself a trade, lad. This is you know what I mean. <laughs> Not a good game to go in. Years ago, when we first started in the early nineties, stuff you were getting major, massive, massive advances. That like if you if you were careful with your money, you know what I mean. You'd get, you'd, you'd, you'd have some money or buy give get yourself some wages and stuff. Now all these companies just want everything for nothing. They want your album finished. You want your videos doing, and they'll just put it out and take. There's one company I know that take fifty percent. Jesus. So oh. it's just so hard for the like up and coming for up and coming musicians and, and writers. But there is a hell of a lot of good stuff out there as well nowadays, mate. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing, don't get heard now, though, does it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And no one no one buys music, even like downloads and stuff like that. You just, you just stream it. So yeah. I don't know how you make money out of it, no one. Is that the only really good income you get then through merch? Well, I don't even know. That's not even good income, do you know what I mean? That's just like uh, my pay for like. Probably pay for our rides out on the nights. <laughs> but you know what I mean? When we're, when we're touring, the um, the venues can't, because it all depends on your ticket prices and how many tickets you're going to sell. Once it goes over a certain, certain amount, yeah, you can you can get more for gigs and stuff like that. But when you're on, like still on the grassroots level, like, like we are after 35 years, we're still playing small clubs, like, like 200 people, something like that, 300 people. So it's hard to make money out of it, definitely. The thing is, as well, with live music, it's a good way to get bands seen and stuff, but ticket prices have gone up massively and venues are closing down and everything just going yeah. against it. It's just unreal, mate. But it's not just like ticket price. It's, it's, say, if you want to do a gig in, in Glasgow on a weekend, probably people only go out the weekends. The hotels have tripled than what they were on a Monday. On a yeah, Tuesday. yeah. So, do you know what I mean? You've got to account all of that. You can't drive to Glasgow and then drive all the way home just to to do an, an hour and a half show, do you know what I mean? So, yeah, it's, it's everything. It's mad. Yeah, it's crazy. So, we, you've, we've mentioned the tour, and uh, you mentioned you're hopefully getting some new music out. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, um, I'm in here now. We have we never, ever stopped writing. Only It's been about a good few months where we've ripped this place out, started again, bought all brand new equipment. Um we started well, while our engineer was out party. We, we worked with since since the start of our career. Um, while he was out with a bad back, we um, strangely enough, we bumped into Jimmy Miller's engineer in Liverpool. He, he's he's actually from New Zealand, and he was is he was visiting Liverpool. His wife was working in Liverpool, so um, he came over and set up some some of the new stuff. We recorded four songs with him. We're back and we're back now. We're on onto another four. 
So I was about to say, there, within lockdown, me, our kid and our Dixie had a good few writing sessions in here, which some of them might get used on the new really stuff. If not on the really stuff, it might be on the Sums album, Dixie's stuff. Um, yeah, they were just constantly writing and trying to get in. You know what I mean? What uh, what stinks he doing now then? He, he, he in a bank called Small oh, he was in bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then he was in a bank called he was in a bank called Cook the Books years and years ago. That's when like Dixie first started. A Liverpool band in the eighties, very early eighties called Cook the Books. He was in Smaller. He was signed to um, a subsidiary of a uh, Creation, which was uh, Better Records. I think they were called with a guy called Tim Abbey from Birmingham. So they had their first album out on that with Smaller, and then he's got a band called The Sums now. Uh, and they've had about three albums out, I think, just on their own little label. Yeah. It's really good. Some of it's a bit crazy, like, but some of it's really good. <laughs> I'll have to check it out, yeah, yeah. yeah the Sums. The Sums, uh, S-U-M-S? Yeah, as in Sums, because he's crap at Sums. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for that, uh, Chris. I've really enjoyed it. It's been a great to talk to you. No worries, Ethan, man. Thank you, Alice. You're all sources. Nice one, lad. Nice one. Cheers. All right. Cheers. See you later, man. See ya.